Well, we're happy that you're all here, and for those who are watching online, we're happy to have you here as well. Um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and do our um, offering, our tithes and offerings. We're about to get the ushers to come up. You can bring your offerings to the front. You can also, we have a box in the back, or if you like most of the millennial <laughs> <laughs> we just do it online, so there's time yeah, yeah. as well, and then you can give your offerings and uh, ties timely as well. You can set them up to recurse, you know, but let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll continue in worship. Father, we thank you this morning, we thank you that we have a reason to praise, because you are alive, and you are great, so we give you praise this morning, God. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the people, God. I pray that your presence would just come in right now and would rest in this place, God. I pray for the offerings, the tithes and the offerings, God, that you would bless them, that you would bless the offerings and the tithes and the givers, Father. We just thank you, God, for all that you've done and what you're doing. And we give you praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
from our lips, from our mind, different situations, but all God wants is for us to have a heart of worship and to give that to Him, all of our heart. So let's worship this morning and sing heart of worship.
and honor it is to be able to praise him yeah. in public, yeah. in a place of gathering. Sometimes I, I can't help but think about the story when Perry Stone was preaching to an underground church. And they had it on a satellite. They were underground and they had a screen. And you know those folks, they lifted their hands. They worshipped without words. Their mouth moved, but they couldn't make a sound. They would clap like this where their hands didn't touch. God forgive us when we take a time that is free that we had that we might not always have. You can look around and know that it's very, very near that your Bibles and your freedom to worship could come to an end. You better have it in your heart if it does. If you can't clap, why? What would you do? We gotta come back to a heart of worship when it doesn't matter what sound we make, what motions we make, that God, if I had to stand in a prison or be martyred or whatever it would be, I better have a worship in my heart because the sound and the clapping and all those things we won't have. Let's get back to a heart of worship because at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. Worship will take you a long way in a lot of situations. Ride the wave of worship out of the troubled sea. Oh Lord, I thank you, God, we have freedom. Just 
stony places, that you'll plow up the fallow ground, that you'll plow up the rocks and move the thorns, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you look into our hearts this morning. Reveal to us what's hidden therein. Lord God, I pray that you bring us to repentance, Lord. That we would freely worship you and realize where we are. We give you all the praise and glory. Bless this word now as we seek your face and learn what you would have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name. to dig into some of the, the sermons that I've done before or something. It, it was just nothing, nothing come. I began to pray and for a couple days I'm praying, you know, I need a word. I need a word for these people, for your people. And so I would still look at some sermons and and finally he, he dropped this on me. And it, it's kind of exciting when he does that to me. It's, it's new and it's fresh to me and it's I enjoy when God does that and so he begins stirring this word in my heart and I've been working on it all week so prayerfully this morning I can deliver it to you if you turn in your Bible to the book of Hosea Hosea chapter 1 we're going to look at verse 1 the word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Uri. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of the harlotry, and children of the harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Hosea is sent, and here's the setting. For 176 years, the north tribes of Israel and the south two tribes of Benjamin and, of, of Benjamin and Judah, which were called Judah, have been divided. They disagreed, separated themselves, and so ten tribes in the northern region, they've, they've set up their own government and they've separated from Judah. This, these events happened ten years after Amos, who had come to preach and tell the people and warn them of the, the coming Judgment that's going to come on them for what they're doing. So Hosea comes in the last two years of Jeroboam, his Jeroboam the second of his twenty-two year old reign, the twenty-two year reign as king of Israel. It's a prosperous and peaceful time in this time. Because of their location, Israel was in control of the trade routes. They were in control of the interstate, the I-12, the I-10. We're familiar with that. A lot of, a lot of people going north and south traveled through here. That's kind of the way they are. They're positioned in a place to where the major trade routes they're in control of. The merchants that travel from Palestine down to Egypt have to go through here. If you don't, then there's mountains and valleys on either side, and it's really treacherous. So instead of going the back roads, 
they're going to go the main interstate. But being as there is an interstate, just like our interstate, there's taxes to be collected on this interstate. So people traveling through there, when the merchants would come, they would pay tolls to go through there to pay for the maintenance of the roads and to also line the pockets of the politicians. I mean, that's <laughs> different than the way it is today. But it could be up to 20% of whatever goods that they're traveling through there. That's how they would tax them and pay their toll. It wasn't like it's just 10 cents to everybody who travels through here. It depends on how much you were bringing through. So with this 20% they were reaping off of each of these people that are traveling through here, they were becoming very wealthy. They were able to buy things. The rich got richer and the poor got poorer. The poor would often have to go into slavery because they couldn't afford to pay their debts anymore. They had been... The rich had been soaking up all the money with their little schemes and tolls and taxes, and they ripped people off. The status symbol of choice in these days is to have a summer home up in the mountains. You'd have your winter home that's here in the city, but then you'd have this summer home, the vacation home. The camp. And so that was the status symbol of choice. If you had money, you had a camp. You didn't drive a Mercedes Benz, you had a camp. So in the summer, when it was real hot, they could go up to the summer home and it would be cool up there. And it'd be a nice view, pretty property. But in an attempt to solidify his political position, Jeroboam II set up golden calves in the temple at Bethel and Dan. In his State of the Union address, he even tells them, Behold, here are your gods that brought you out of Egypt. Now they should be way far away from dealing with these calves. I mean, this is way back. But here we go again. We're bringing the calves out. And so we're setting, up, setting them up in the temple. Not some... In the, in the worship center. In, they've come to the River of Life family. The, the, they've come here and they've set up a golden calf. Right here in the middle of the church. He's even appointed the preachers and teachers in the temple. Now, Jeroboam is not, he's not supposed to be selecting who preaches and teaches in the temple. But to get his agenda to move forward, we got to get rid of the Levites that are supposed to be there. And he chose people of his own choice. People that would support his agenda. Hmm. Sounds more like a bunch of senators and stuff than the the church to me. So they were attending church and they're listening to singular sensitive preachers that are teaching them to trust in God so to appeal to their fleshly desires. They would go to the temples and have sex with male and female prostitutes in the belief that their crops would be fertile and they would grow good crops and they would have a good harvest. Now, this is quite appealing to these carnally minded church folk because I can have my cake and eat it too. I can go to church and live carnally and, so, and do the things that my flesh wants and still go to church and I can feel good about myself because the church supports me. The judicial system was so corrupt that if you didn't have money, you didn't get justice. Mm -hmm. Now, that's much different than it is today. <laughs> you see the parallels here? With, with, this isn't so far-fetched. These 
are church people. See, in this time, there was only one group of people worshiping Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Everybody else had these plethora of gods. They might have included Jehovah, maybe. But most of them had Mercury and Venus and Mars and all them other planets. <laughs> they worshiped all these other things. But these are church people. These are people that are set apart. This isn't just a bunch of heathens. These are church people. The top ten of the country, you know, music often, often tells what a culture is about. Listen to their music and you can tell what they're about, what they like. Because if it's on the radio and if it's on the TV, it's because people want it there. If it's not on there, then people don't want it. People only want to see something and they're going to put on there what people want to see. So we see this stuff today. But what you're seeing is what people want to see. If nobody wanted to watch it, they wouldn't watch it. It wouldn't be on TV. So let's, let's do some Casey Case of Countdown. The top ten of the day. Now I wasn't there, but I'm just giving me a little liberty here. Um, let's see, number one might have been on the top ten. It's uh, Shackles for Nothing by the Prosperity Group. <laughs> House on a Hill by the High Rollers. <laughs> Holy Cow by the Egyptians. <laughs> the Love Shack by the Temple Worship Band. <laughs> Under the in Influence oh. by Indulgence. Oh. Judge in My Pocket by the Corruption. <laughs> Make My Garden Grow by the Harlots. <laughs> And go with the flow by the false prophets. Oh, Breaking the law by the idols. <laughs> and this one, you may think that this song is fairly new, but it actually goes way back. Walk like an Egyptian by the temptation. <laughs> then you thought that was a modern song. <laughs> Their relationship and dependence on God was at an all-time low. Now, these are church people now. Don't be beating them up because they're a bunch of heathens. These are church folks. A bunch of misguided church folks that have lost their relationship with God. God had every right to divorce Israel. He had married Israel. Made a covenant with Israel. He had every right to divorce them and go find somebody else to worship him. He had every right. But you see, God, because of his unconditional love, his faithfulness, he wouldn't let them go. They're, they're doing this and spiting him, but he won't let them go because he loves them so much. But, on the other hand, his holiness and righteousness can't allow this to continue on. Something's got to give. You see, God sometimes prepared prophets through their relationships. If we look at Jeremiah, he was told not to marry. He wasn't allowed to marry a wife. Now, he wanted to get married. He wanted to have kids. But God told him, you're not to get married. Number one, to spare him from raising a family in the inevitable pestilence that was to come and the famine that would befall him at that time. It might have been difficult. He, he might have lost his wife. He might have lost his kids. So God, in his mercy, spared him from that. And it also served as a sign of the judgment to come on God's bride as a consequence for their disobedience. See, Jeremiah was going to need to understand where God's coming from. And so God made it personal. Ezekiel, this is heartbreaking. Ezekiel 
God told him he and his wife would die, but not to mourn for her. That's heartbreaking. He got married and has kids. And God's going to take his wife, not some woman that he doesn't love, a woman that he cherished. But he tells, he, he, he tells Ezekiel that she's going to die. You're not to mourn for her. Because Solomon's temple, which was the delight of the people's eyes, was going to be destroyed. And they were going to be taken captive. And the delight of his eyes, of Ezekiel's eyes, was his wife. And so, for Ezekiel to learn what this feels like to God, that his relationship, the place where Israel would meet and come to love and, and meet with God and bring him his offerings and, and tell him how much they love and appreciate him, that place is fixing to be destroyed along with their relationship and God couldn't stand it. But because they, did, they were determined to break His law, they were determined to chase false gods, He was going to have to destroy the place and tear it down. They made it all about the building and not about the relationship. God wanted a relationship. The building's nice and everything. But the relationship's what he was after. It could be a, a, an old shack out in the middle of the woods. As long as he can have a relationship with his people. In order for him to understand how God, the love of God had for Israel, Hosea had to experience betrayal from a self-indulging carnal wife. So Hosea is fixing to learn a hard lesson. He doesn't, he's not commanded. God says, go marry this woman, this woman that you don't know, don't know what she is, who she is. He tells, he just gives the specifics. Go marry a harlot. So now Hosea has to choose this person. God didn't say, go choose this woman. He didn't say, go marry Gomer. It says, that he chose Gomer. So he goes out and he looks for the kind of woman God tells him to marry. Now this is the man of God. And he switched to marry a harlot. He's marrying not only a harlot, but a woman that is one of the worshipers in the temple that would sell herself in order to fulfill the lust of these people that want their crops to grow and they want to sow their oats. So he chooses, chooses Gomer. Ha, ha, harlotry is the same thing as idolatry to God. When you see harlotry, God is talking about idolatry. So he marries Gomer, and Gomer bears him a child. So he has a son, and God tells him to name his son Yezerel, which means God sows. Yezerel was a defiant and unruly child in need of discipline. A lot like the children of Israel at this time. So then he bears a daughter. Lo Rakama, which means no mercy. She was a neglected child, deprived of the love of her mother. Because when she was weaned, her mother goes back out. She's married to Hosea, but she goes back out and she begins to work in the temple, being a harlot again. And then there's a third son. Our second son, third child, Lo Amen Am I, meaning not my people. He was a child from another man. So 
he was disowned by Hosea because he was not Hosea's child. Like Israel, Gomer runs to pursue her lovers who will provide food and water and clothing and all of her basic needs and even oil and wine and pleasures and things that she wants. So she goes to chase after this lifestyle that Hosea is not providing for her. In verse 2 and 8, God says this, For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for battle worship. See, everything that she's chasing after from these men are things that God made and God provided. And she's chasing after them. This is God trying to talk to them. You're chasing after all these things. But I'm the one that's providing them. These people are illegitimate. They have these things. They borrowed them. And you're chasing them. But you're not going to get them. All the things that God owns and provides and they're chasing after with these other gods. Now remember, these are church people that are attending church, but they're not serving God. These are church people that are bound by carnal, earthly flesh. These are church people. They, they're indulging in pornography, Alcoholism was rampant at this time. I know it's not that way now. <laughs> addictions. Addictions that are destroying them. Lust. They're seeking after wealth and all the things this wealth will buy. Lowering their dependence on God. These are church folks. They're having adulterous relationships. Church folks. We may think by our own efforts that how we get things what, and what we want is because we go to work and we make a paycheck and we bring it home and we buy those things. And it's all because I did that. I worked all this time. I worked. I spent 12 hours, 8 hours, 10 hours, 16 hours at some place. You may think that when you go to work, you're buying all this. But you know what? You're just barring. Yeah. God gives you the ability to go to work. You can be stricken with not the, without the use of your limbs, without eyesight, and how are you going to go to work and do that? If God doesn't give you the health and ability to go to work, you're not going to get anything. Everything we have comes from God. So God warns them that they will chase after all these needs and desires, but they're not going to get them. They're going to keep running and chasing after them. And, and that happens today. People run and chase after money and wealth and, and the things it provides, but they still can't get it. There's never enough. The wealthiest people in this world are looking for their next million. People that would never need money again for the rest of their life are still seeking for their next dollar. But in reality, they chase after these things, but their crops are going to fail anyway. In this time, they had natural disasters that destroyed crops. Things out of their control. Things that their money couldn't fix. Animals would destroy the vines and fig trees. When they would go down to the Walmart, it would look like the day before a hurricane. All the shelves wiped out. Their paychecks would bounce. Their parties and festivals would cease. And after... She has the children. She leaves to pursue her lovers. And ultimately, 
They will be taken captive in exile. So God sends out His children. He sends out Israel discipline, lower comma, deprivation, and low am I disowned to plead with her, to come home. God disciplines us. Then because of our lack of communication, He will, it will deprive us of our love. We won't know love and we won't have the love of God. We won't know how to love people. We won't be able to love anybody. We won't know how to love somebody because we've lost our relationship with Him. And finally, it results in separation. When you're separated from God, then all of your relationships, everything lacks. You go chasing and nothing fulfills you. And ultimately, it can lead to eternal separation from God. Exile to the pits of heaven. But God loves these people. He doesn't want to see all this happen. He's, at, he's, he's pleading with them. I've sent my discipline. Your separation from me is causing you to suffer for love, but I don't want you to be destroyed, utterly destroyed. So finally, Gomer finds herself in the public square up for auction. Her debts have amounted so much that she can't, she can no longer be profitable to the people that pay her. So now she has to go to the auction block to try to settle the debts that she owes. There's three ways you end up on the auction block. Number one, you can be a POW and forced into slavery by the people that have taken over your country and brought you there. That's the first way. Second way, you can be born into slavery. Someone that's already a slave, when you're born, you became a slave also. And number three in this situation is to pay your debts that you can't pay. So she would be taken to the public square where the auction is. She will be stripped naked so everyone can inspect her and see her health and see how profitable she could be to them for them to make money off of her when they were to bid on her. And the bidders would inspect their health, ability to work, and determine how much she is worth. It's humiliating, but see, we're naked before God sitting in this building. Every one of us, God looks at our heart, mm -hmm. and He sees our heart and knows where our heart is. Yes. So the auctioneer steps up. I'm going to start the bidding in one shekel. Do I have one shekel? One shekel, anybody? We have one shekel over here. Got here two. Two shekels. Two shekels. We got two shekels. Y'all here five shekels. Five shekels. Anyone? Five shekels. It's starting to get a little expensive. We got one high roll back. High <laughs> Finally, Hosea. Fifteen shekels. Fifteen shekels. Do I hear? Fifteen. And. One and a half owners of barley, which is worth another 15 shekels. So he's not being everybody or a woman that's not worth that much. She's not even worth it. You know how much that was back in that day? That was six months' salary. A half a year's work that he just paid for a woman that wasn't worth that much. In Numbers 5.15, the 
The law states that three quarts of barley was a sacrifice given for an offering called the jealousy offering. Now he's just offered 53 times more than that. The jealousy offering is brought when you suspect that your wife has cheated on you. And so you would go to the temple and you would give this three quarts of barley, which that's 160 quarts that he's just given for her. So then you would bring her to the, the temple and then you would give your offering and then the priest would, would uh, ask her questions and you're before God. You're, it's like standing, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. So you're standing in the temple where God could strike you dead if you don't tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. So the total cost of this redemption was 30 shekels, which was the redemption price stated in Exodus 21 for a slave. Mm. So he just redeemed Gomer for 30 shekels of silver. See, make no mistake about it. Satan has made a substantial investment in each and every one of our lives in this place. We will all find ourselves on the auction block, up for auction. There is no rich person on this planet that has enough money to pay and outbid Satan for what we are owed. What we owe, our debt of sin is so great. There's nobody on this plan. You're not going to go to the year Gator and get him to represent you in court. It's not happening. You're not going to get the E guarantee. <laughs> when we're placed on the auction block, we're going to be stripped naked before God and everything will be seen. Everything we've ever done will be seen. And the debt that we've incurred is going to be there in full view. And Satan is going to say, I've got $30 million in this one. This one's mine. That one over there? Yep. Him too. Yep. Him too. Yep. Her back in the back. Yep. Nobody's going to outbid me. In verse 2 and 6, says, therefore behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. Come on, now, man. this sounds like a roadblock. But what this is, is God, the path that God wants her to go on, He's hedged up with thorn bushes. And not those little stinker briars like you pick like berries, not those. I'm talking some heavy thorns. So God is going to hedge this path to keep them on the path. And if they stray, it's not going to stop you from straying. But it's going to be painful for you to stray off the path. So it's an act of mercy, God, to create this pain for us to go through. If we stray off the path, it's to help keep us on the path. If He didn't put that, it'd be easy to just go off and go your own way. But God loves us so much. He's trying His best to protect us from getting off the straight and narrow path. You see, Jesus, when He went to the cross, He, he became the high bidder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Satan came out bidding. Mm -hmm. yeah. But somebody's got to accept me. So will you accept the bid that Jesus, he's just placed the bid that's worth way more than we're worth. I know I'm not worth one, one tiny drop of blood. I'm not worthy of the 
the sweat off of his brow, much less the blood from his veins. But he's given us He's bought us, redeemed us. But well, will you accept it? Will he be the one that's going to take you home? Or will you go home to your old God? Which
There's a new day just ahead. I've come to take you home. You know, this morning, this morning God's calling. There may not be people in here that that happened except for Jesus Christ. But each and every one of us knows somebody that God needs to bring in, that's on the auction block right now. So I invite you at this time to, to lift them up. <coughs> that Jesus would intervene on their behalf. That they would realize that He has put up the highest bid. They don't have to suffer. They don't have to go they don't have to be eternally separated from God in the pits of hell. This morning, if you want to come and lift that person up, that God would reach out and intervene. Put the thorns up on their path so they can't go left and they can't go right. And when they're hurting and in pain because they tried to go the, the wrong way, then you'll be there. You'll be ready for God to to intervene in their, on their behalf and lead them and guide them into repentance. If you want to lift someone up, if you have a prayer request, I invite you to come and we'll pray to see God. He wants nothing more than to heal and set, and, and set us free. In Jesus' name. Bound by sin, a broken slave. From the depths of my despair, I prayed for mercy. I heard the words the price was paid on the cross for you that day. Take my hand now, child, and welcome to the family. Oh, 
Mama's house. He brought him some breakfast from Mama's house. And right after he pulled out onto the road, some guy went with his lane and hit him head on. And he's got a broken ankle or foot. And he was actually in surgery this morning. The doctor said that it's going to probably take a, a few surgeries to get him here. And, um, and I think he might have a broken shoulder. Um, but we're just praising God that he's alive. Because if you see the pictures of his vehicle, he, his angels are working to keep him alive. But just be praying for Uncle Hank. Um, also, um, Rocky surgery is this Thursday. So um, they're leaving on Tuesday to go to Houston. They have to do all the pre-op appointments again for him. And they've been very careful staying home. That's why you haven't seen Robert here. Um, but just be praying that all goes well and as scheduled. Yeah. 
Andy Lodge is getting married on his birthday, so he's giving up his birthday for this wedding. And Shay's birthday and Miss Serenin's 50th anniversary. It's just a good day. It's a good day. It's a good day to have a wedding, yeah. But, um, yeah, so uh, I think that's all the announcements that I have. So you guys have an awesome week. Just keep praying. Pray for those requests, especially for Rocky. And God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday night.